Uh, we're going to get into the next segment, uh, which we're going to be doing every Monday night uh, at the end of each show, Ask the Pastor. Uh, so we've talked about a whole lot of things. Um, we're going to do this for 30 minutes or, or so. Uh, we talk about a whole lot of things. I'm sure there's a lot of questions on the table, um, especially, you know, uh, some things about how does this relate biblically um, that I'd like to ask, and I'm sure y'all would too. So uh, I'll introduce our guest, Pastor Mike Isham, and the floor is open for questions after he gives his introduction. I'm Pastor Mike Isham, Voice in the Wilderness Ministries. I want to thank you all for having me here. I know that this is can be an unorthodox situation, but um, I'll try to do what I can to respond and, and talk to you frankly and biblically about what all of this means. If you're willing to hear what the Lord has got to say, it will bless you, it will help you, it will give you an understanding and a wisdom of what life and death really means. So Anybody have a, want to start off with a, a question for our pastor? <coughs> saying I'll, I'll, I'll just say this because you know what I'm saying do 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 you feel like the the whole situation do you feel like it was like a type of sacrifice like to any type well of I think it was more of a demonic attack sacrifice means you put something on an altar that sheds blood I think more or less this was a spiritual attack um, using his devices to deceive the people to get into a place and then he, he, he you know the scripture says he doesn't come before to steal, to kill, and to destroy. So killing is part of his deal. He has no problem with it. He can do it without God's covering. Um, you know, that's why an alcoholic can die before their time. That's why a meth addict can die before their time. God may have set aside a time for their life on this earth, but if you destroy yourself, or you allow yourself to be destroyed, then you, he can abort your life significantly. And just because you, when you come to Christ sometimes, you, the effects of alcoholism or drug use or even demonic influence can, can be tough. I mean, you know, there is consequences. So the idea behind it is that I do not think that this was a sacrificial system. I don't think the devil put everybody up there to sacrifice them. I do believe that the devil brought you all together to slaughter you. Because any child that he can abort their life means that child can't come to Christ. And every child he can get in, or every young adult he can get in, and throw, put the world in, it's that much harder for to come to Christ. And self-destructive behavior is permeated with youth. A lot of people, they don't have no problem driving cars out, you know, stone or taxi, whatever. So self-destructive behavior is the devil's deception. Uh, we think we're young, we think we're bulletproof, we think we can run through walls. We think we can make all the money we want, have all the women we want, or men we want, we do anything we want, and there's no consequence to it because we have an air, because we're young, we have an aura of invincibility. And you can see in this concert how really startling it is because all of those children that were murdered were between, four, last time I checked, between 14 and 27, which is the prime of life. And if you can find God in your teenage years or your young adult years, you present to the devil a very, very significant opposing spiritual strength that he is unable to control or take care of. You can influence other younger people, and that presents a far greater threat to him than any ministry you ever involved in. The devil wants and specifically goes to youth. And if you read Ezekiel 23, 28, 13 through 16, there are some implications uh, expositors of that scripture that he was a minister of music in heaven because of the instruments involved in verses 15 and 16 of Ezekiel 28 he was at the very least a musician and that's where a lot of this problem comes from entry point into a child's life and I'm 63 so I know y'all think you're men and stuff like that and women and all that and you are but when you get to my age thank God you've got this youth on your side because you get over you know uh, a, a, a sense of uh, invincibility, but as you get older, you'll realize your mortality is very, very real. So, no, it's not a sacrifice. I do not believe that Satan sacrificed eight children at the altar of his throne. I believe that he gathered a group of people together and forced them to destroy themselves uh, in the panic. Um, his, his messages are clear and abundant all through that stage. 
Um, I have no problem with freedom of self-expression, but when you glorify Satan, he's going to show up. If you have people with skulls and you have people with devils on their shirts and coming through portals and all of that kind of thing, the, the young man who is, I don't know anything about the young man, but, but obviously he's at the very least misguided about what spirituality is. And, you know, when it comes to God, there's God and there's everything else. And everything else is Satan. And so, but this battle is for the souls of men and women. And ultimately, who wins is determines whether you're in heaven or hell. Because there is a hell. And I know that we live in a Christian faith that doesn't preach about hell anymore, but it really ought to. Because Jesus spoke more about hell than he did any other subject. And, and he warned, and he did because he didn't want to see anybody go there. And he came specifically to save you from hell. He didn't want to see anybody go to hell. Nobody want, but understand this. In fact, the scripture says in Matthew 25, 41, that hell was made for the devil and his angels. He never intended for a human being to go to hell. It was never made for man. It was never, ever made for man. It was made as a judgment to the devil and his angels when all this is said and done. And when it's all said and done, they are going there. Yes, ma'am. Um, I got a question. Was this like a warning for us? Yes. And it's going to get worse. I have a yes. Do you think this so-called ritual was intended? Like, was it like was it intended? Like, did he want this to happen? Like, like, like planned? Yeah. Oh, yeah, what, was it planned? Yeah, what, what, what both of them are asking is they're talking about like Illuminati. Like, do do you think that okay. Travis Scott himself was aware? of what was happening like did he sacrifice these people in order to get to the next level of music i do not think so okay. i think that the devil used his ignorance i don't think the man wanted anybody to die i think that's the worst kind of feeling about it. nobody wants to see anybody die i don't think there's any musician unless you are a cultic satanist where you would get pleasure from seeing people suffering or a complete masochist um Nobody likes to see anybody suffer. I do think that this is a spirit using... Uh, uh, let me give you an example. Because we're, we're, we're quick to point this out. An average child from the time they're 5 years old to the time they're 21 years old witnesses 11,000 to 12,000 murders. They see it on TV. They see it on their... And now you've got video wow. games where people are capable of killing millions of millions of people in a controlled video environment um, and every one of those people are not real. They will get back up. You can turn and rewind it and go right back to the same people who are doing the same thing. It doesn't work that way in life. And a lot of the media sources have programmed young children, young adults, teenagers to be oblivious to the value and the sanctity of life itself. And this is the problem you have when someone walks out and goes into a school and shoots them. They feel nothing. There's no remorse. They do not understand the magnitude of what they've done until after the fact. Sometimes it isn't even there. Their eyes are soulless. Their movements are calculated for one thing, and that's mass destruction. That's all they've seen. And when people start dying and stuff like this, the rest of the world goes back and says, how did that happen? Well, in many ways, this world has programmed them to be that way. Yeah. Whether he's not of the Illuminati or the Illuminati, for anyone who does not know, is a, is a super secret group of men that are wealthy and believe that they, uh, want, they can control the world through their intelligence or their wealth. Many people from Jay-Z to President Bush to President Obama, all of these people have been rumored to be part of the Illuminati. The simple fact of the matter is that they are not, we don't know if they're part of the Illuminati. Um, we don't know who those men are that try to control the world. Because it's but secret. It's a secret. They've always been a secret sect, much like the Knights Templar and much like some of the other uh, years ago, the Masons was a super secret deal from the top down. Yeah. Um, and some of these secret societies present a very clear and present problem. God is a God of, of light. And there's, you know, when Christ came, he, God has always been represented with light. He's been represented with bread, or food, or water, or air. All of these things that survive are an aspect or a type and shadow of God's provision for you. 
anything outside of that is the devil. Do you guys know how the devil got to be the devil? How, how he disobeyed God? Yeah. You know how he got to be the devil? He's an angel. Yeah, he's an angel. Wasn't he the... Well, why did he fall? Because he, he tried to over, overthrow oh, God yeah. because he thought he can be God. Well, yeah. Because he was praised to him for his beauty because they say this was one of the most beautiful angels God had right. up there. And right. I guess he, it got to his head and he tried to overthrow God and God put him. What did he say? What did Lucifer say? What did he say about God? He said, I could be you. He said, I could be better than you. Oh. He said, I will exalt God. I will. I will. I will. I will. I will. See, the problem with most Christian faith and most in the secular world, once it gets outside of what you think or feel, it stops being real. And what that does is that creates a spiritual detachment, not only from God, but from your call, from your purpose, for what you do. And when, ha when that happens, it's very hard to find him back without the Holy Spirit bringing you back. So here's why I said this. In Isaiah 14, verse 12 through 15, it says, thou art, How thou art fallen, O Lucifer, thou son of the morning, who did trip the nations. You were cast to the earth, for you said, I will set my throne above God. I will sit in the congregation of the righteous to the north. I will ascend above heaven. I will be like the most high, but you are cast down to hell. That's exactly, read Isaiah 14, 12 through 15. I will, I will. Now here's where human beings come in. In the Garden of Eden, God gave human beings one rule. Do you know what that rule is? You shall not eat the tree oh, of the yeah. knowledge of good and evil. They could yeah. live their lives. Any, he gave them one stinking thing to do. <laughs> one. And they did it. One job. Everybody ever heard the old saying, one blankety blank job? Yeah, human beings had one job. Stay away from that tree. They could have any other tree they wanted. They could do anything they wanted. In time they wanted, all they do is take care of the garden so it would grow food for them. And they could walk, talk, sleep, drink, whatever they want to do, anytime they want to, but don't touch the knowledge of the tree of the garden. The knowledge of good and evil on the tree in the garden. Well, now I'm going to get to that. we talking about the gardens being Right, that, and that was what Travis was doing, right. planting gardens. But that, that in and of itself means nothing, but here's where the rub is. Now the serpent was more subtle, Genesis 3, than any other beast in the field. And he goes to the woman and he said, Did God say you couldn't eat of the tree in the, uh, eat, eat of the, of the trees in the garden? And she said, No, we can eat of any tree in the garden, but the tree that is in the midst of the garden, God has said that in that day that you eat of it or touch it, you're going to die. He reminds Satan of what God said. Satan said, You will not die. But in the day that you eat of it, your eyes shall be opened and you shall be like God, knowing good and evil. And when she saw the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired of, she took the food and ate, and then she gave it to her husband and ate. And instantly they realized they were naked. Now, the sin is not the eating of the fruit. When that woman believed she could be like God, and convinced her husband she could be like God, she did the same thing that Lucifer did with Lucifer did when he was judged. That's the same. You not, you not see the same parallel in that? What is division between human beings and God? Most people think they can be just like God. They don't need God. I don't need God. Look at me. I got my looks. I got my money. I got my swag. I got my street creed. I'm, I'm just fine. Doesn't work that way. And the ultimate deal is God has sent ministers like me and hopefully others around here to help you understand the separation, why there's separation between human beings or God. If God is making mankind, like Miss Rose said, in his image and likeness, then why is man separated from God? Man is separated from God because man chose to be like God, to be his own person, to be everything he ever needed, he can do himself. He's self-sufficient. He's eternal. He's just fine. He's not. He doesn't need God for anything in life. And you guys feel that way? No. You shouldn't. You're not. And here's the deal. How many remember we talked about? You guys talked about blood. Yeah. Why is blood important? It's the life giver. It holds everything that you need to live. 
the scripture says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. Yeah. Do you know that if your heart stops, you can get another heart? Mm -hmm. And you'll live? Mm -hmm. Do you know that if you lose your kidneys, you can get another kidney and you'll live? Mm -hmm. Do you know if you lost your brain, you can live? Do you know if you lost every, anything in your body, they can replace it? Just about. And you'll live. But what happens when the blood stops flowing? You die. You're dead. Yeah. Within three minutes, rigor mortis sets in, and there's no coming back without a miracle from God. And don't count on that. The blood is the life that God, the blood represents life. Do you understand that? Do you understand how important that is? How many know that if your blood is sick, did you know this? That if your blood is sick, you can get something called a transfusion, and they take the old, dead, dying, sick blood. And they put fresh blood in you, yeah. and that you'll live. But dialysis is kind of. Oh. Same but they'll put fresh blood in you, and you live. Do you understand the spiritual connotation of that? Yeah. Life is in the blood. You now, here's why that's important. The atonement for sin in the sight of God is only one. And by the way, I'm sorry, it's not good enough. The only acceptable atonement, the remission of sins in the sight of Jehovah God, is the shedding of blood. He will not forgive your sins unless blood is shed for it. You understand that? Well, in the Old Testament, they're talking about physical blood. In the New Testament, God poured out His blood in His Son Jesus Christ for you, so that your sins are forgiven. Do a simple acknowledgement and commitment and promise to turn from your sins and not do them anymore. When you ask forgiveness of God and Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ covers your sin and removes you from the burden of eternal damnation and you are back reconciled to God through the shedding of that blood. That cross represents all of God's love poured out for you. God didn't forget your sins. He punished Christ with your sins on the cross. And when you ask forgiveness, it doesn't mean that you're going to be punished for your sins. It means Christ punished, took the punishment of God, the wrath of God for your sins. He never forgot your sins. Your sins were paid for. And it's done with the shedding of blood. There is, listen to me, there is no other, no other acceptable atonement for sin other than the blood of Jesus Christ. And the devil wants you to think about everything else but that. People say they're Christians, they're on their way to hell because they haven't been to the cross. Every single time. I never preach or teach anywhere, anytime, with anyone without asking them to get saved. Period. And I've been, I've been ridiculed and criticized for it. Because you're not all saved. And most people aren't saved because they've been taught that salvation... Here, here's the problem you have. God tells you you're just wonderful the way you are. Well, you're not just wonderful the way you are. You won't, you know, you won't be on your way to hell. There's a problem with sin. You may have good attributes. A man may have good attributes. A man may have good feelings. A man may give away all his money, but without his sins forgiven, it doesn't make any difference. Why? Because you're infinitely, you infinitely need God. That's God's portal to you. Is the shedding of blood. And here's why that's so very important. Are y'all still with me? Yes. Y'all understand what I'm saying here? Because when Christ removes your sin, you become a habitation of God. Do you know that the Christian faith is the only religion where God lives literally in you by the Spirit? Now, He can't live in you if your sin remains. If you're in your sin, if you're lying, cheating, stealing, whatever you're doing, the purpose of the cleansing of the sin is so God can live in you and prepare you to meet Him when this is all over with. That's the whole name of the game. Now, here's the devil's end. Everything but that. Whether it's religion, whether it's contemporary society, whether it's music, whether it's narrative or vernacular, whether it's culture, whether it's video or, or audio or whatever, anything he can get you to do to avoid that, that's what he's going to do. So as far as him taking people and sacrificing them on the altar, no. As far as causing people to die and go to hell, do tragedy, 
That's what he does. I have That's a question. But I'll, I'll, go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, just because you brought that up. So, okay. When you have an event like what happened this weekend, right. there's clearly satanic things happening. Right. There's, it's everywhere. Right? right. For the Christian who knows better, right, that decides to stay, right. Let's say that Christian passed away at that concert, right. And I'm not talking about these kids that died. I'm just saying for future, right. If that Christian passed at that concert and stayed there, knowing that it was not right. Is that person, have they stepped outside of God's covering? You get what I'm saying? Like, I, I know well, we can't say who's well, going to it, hell, but... If, if a Christian has gone through the cross of Jesus Christ, I think God will protect them from that happening. Okay, that's true. Yeah. I mean, people, I mean, look, I used to be an alcoholic. Yeah. But I go into, let's say, Applebee's. Applebee's has got a bar, right? Yeah. But it's a restaurant. It's just a restaurant with a bar. Yeah. So I walk past the bar and go in the restaurant and eat. Did I sin? No. Oh, no. Okay. Why? Because I didn't partake of the bar. I walked past the bar and I went in and got some food. Right? Yeah. Because how many people bars pay good money? Most restaurants have bars because they pay better than the restaurant. Yeah. So I go into Applebee's with my wife to eat. That doesn't mean I'm going to take a drink. When I go to Landry's down on Galveston, they have a big bar there. But I walk by the bar and go out and sit on the patio and have coffee with my wife if I sin. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? It's the same thing. I truly believe that a child of God will be protected by God from that. Okay. But you have to understand, if the blood has not covered your sin, you're not... The Christianity, I mean, I see evil people quoting scripture. Yeah. So you have to define Christianity, and the blood is what defines in the sight of God what Christianity is. Go ahead, look like, anybody have another question? Let, and let me also share this to you, because there's a day coming not far from now. And let me offer this to you here. There's a big day coming. Thank you? No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I love this girl. It's that big day where, isn't it, where he comes with where the seven trumpets, there's a day, Revelation 19, 11 through 16. And you might want to hear me well because God has no grandchildren. You're either child of God or not. God has no grandchildren. You stand alone. And when you stand before God, your mother and your father, your husband and your wife, and your children, the lawyers, the preachers, God will be there. And there's no purgatory and there's no little this and that and all that. There's no praying you in. Once your last breath here is your first breath in heaven. Whether you're 17 or whether you're 20 or whether you're 25 or whether you're 60 something like I am, your last breath here will be your next breath in eternity. I got a question. Yes. So my grandma is a minister and she told us that if you don't make it into heaven, our last days on here will be tortured by a beast and get marked. Well, she's talking about the, the book of Revelation. The beast and the marks are the seven-year tribulation which takes place in the book of Revelation. And there will be no more grace, and the devil will have absolute power and control. At the end of the seven years is when Christ comes back. When Christ comes back, Christ is going to come back, and he is going to uh, separate the weak from the tares, from the good and the evil. So... Um, Revelation 11, 19 verse 11 says, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat on it was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many crowns. And he had a name written which no man knew, but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him on white horses. Clothed in fine linen and white and clean. You know you have you know you're on one of those horses? Did y'all know that? Right now? There's one waiting for you. If you're Christian. Who's who's the armies of heaven? The Old Testament saints, the New Testament saints, the angelic host, and the church of the living God. You're the body of Christ. You are his body on this earth. You are his voice. You are his eyes. You are his ears. You are his mouthpiece. You are either speaking life or you're speaking death. 
If you get up and you're worshiping somebody at one of these things that's worshiping death and death, devils and angels, what do you think is going to happen at these things? And, and you have to decide, this is your life. What's done is done. The Christian faith is predicated on, on simple, pure faith. But I will tell you this, faith is what gets you into heaven. Your faith. Because you have to have faith to believe in Christ in this world. Because everything you see is of the devil. And he, had, he says, every one of us who lived here have had to walk by faith and not by sight. You know what I mean? There is a white horse waiting for you, and he's coming back to earth to rule and reign. And there's a little something called the lake of fire in Revelation 20. And the devil and all of these demons that have deceived these people all these years are going to be cast by the archangel Michael into the lake of fire. There's one other problem. Whoever is not written in the Lamb's book of life is also going there. Yes, sir. Uh, Revelation spoke of a war than a thousand years peace. Right. Okay. A thousand year millennium. Okay. Uh, when I was younger, I studied a man named Nostradamus. Right, Nostradamus. He, he, he's got a lot of... The Mexican prophet. Right? Yeah, so, I mean, I didn't know back then what, like, a prophet was. I just right. knew that he was right about a lot of stuff. Right. He predicted in 2025 we'll have World War Three. Right. And in 2036, World War III will be over. And right. we will have a thousand years peace. And then at the end of that thousand years, he hasn't predicted anything else. Right. I know we don't know the time or place, right. but does that kind of fulfill what Revelation has told Not us? Not necessarily. Okay. Because the, Is it because we're on a different timeline with, than heaven? Right. Here's the problem with eschatological events, especially when someone's speaking. Nobody knows a timeline. Yeah. And that's the issue. Um, it's coming back. It's clearly after the tribulation period and after. Uh, but he also comes and gathers the church. How many know something called the rapture? Yeah. The rapture? Yeah, the rapture. The rapture. Or the taken. Right. In First Thessalonians 4, 13. It says, For I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not as others who have no hope. For if Jesus died and rose again, even so them which also sleep in Christ will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain shall not prevent those which are in the ground, or are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the trump of God, and the dead shall rise first, and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up in the clouds to meet to meet them in the, with them in the Lord in the air. And thus shall we ever be with the Lord. So question, like, um, if the last breath here is the first breath in heaven, then but some are asleep. That's what I kind of get confused well, on. Well, that's they're, they're apparently the contemporaries, the soul and spirit will go to heaven. And then a restored body that's washed with the blood is generally considered what goes to heaven. In other words, your body in heaven will be white because it's been washed with the blood of Jesus Christ. Is what Revelation says. So your, your garments and your body will be Sin, you, you will be incapable of sin. So what does it mean to be absent from the body is to be present? With Your the soul body. and spirit return to the Creator. If you will read Ecclesiastes 8.8 8 and Ecclesiastes 12.1 and Job 31 verses uh, 7 verse 1, there is an appointed time for every man to meet the Lord and then the judgment. So um, that time, the soul and spirit return. I mean, all your soul and spirit, when God says you're made in His image and His likeness, that's what he's talking about. I mean, you're not like a cat or a dog because you can make a decision. You can drink and you can be on drugs and you can choose not to anymore. You can, the only reason that most people have for any hope is the fact that they can choose their own decisions. In other words, when you stand before God, you'll be the sum total of the decisions you made. Not your environment, but your decisions will be based... How many of you never do nothing until you decide to? Yeah. Me? Yeah. You know, how many of you will never know, you'll never make a mistake, you'll never sin, you'll never, until, because by accident, you've always chosen to do it. I'm sorry, you had a question? Oh, uh, about uh, people choose to, like, do drugs or whatever. Right. And they, they, they can choose to stop. They can choose to stop. But some people make it seem like they can't do that because they get addicted. Is it because they're, is it, is, is it because they put in their head that, 
Oh, I need this, I need this, and I'm not going to stop. Mm -hmm. that well? mm -hmm. I think it's got a lot to do with uh, willpower. Well, I, I had a bad alcohol problem, yeah, and I, I tried throughout the years to stop. I was a bad, I was a bad alcohol. It wasn't until I decided, and I actually made a promise to God, and I quit cold turkey, which is dangerous, you know, but I leaned completely on God and locked myself in the house for a week. Yeah. You know, I dealt with DTs. I and, cigarettes more. I nearly, yeah. I chewed my lip off. Yeah, but I think those are excuses. Um, now there are physical dependencies and you have to wean off but I think when people do that it's really just making an excuse to not I think so too my you know papa he was a bad smoker until one day he just out of nowhere just stopped yeah. and I'm on a life so you could have been stopped you just chose the mind is a very life. powerful thing you know exactly that's the devil's playground oh yeah um, you know addiction is the worst demon in this and even in all this Addiction is the worst thing that a man can face, whether it's alcohol, drugs, pornography, adultery. Anything that is abuse of your body is the worst kind of devil to face as far as I can. I'd rather swear off with Lucifer himself than try to, to, to deal with an addict, addiction demon. I mean, because once they get a foothold, it's extremely difficult to, to get rid of them. Um, as, is the hard, as far as I'm concerned, the hardest demon to to be delivered from because they always come back um, and it's a, it's a demon that, that you can't see you can't what you can see here is different than that kind. It's and it can subtle, change its face it's a very subtle personal attack of the devil on you yeah. yes ma'am how do you know if like a bad spear or demon trying to come on to you or is around you well that's a very interesting question I, I've, I've dealt with that for 25 years of ministry let me just say unequivocally, I hate deliverance ministry. Or what you would deal with them. I don't like them. They're dangerous. They are bad. They are no good. But that is part of ministry. And Dee and Rose, you better get used to the fact that they're going to come at you all the time. You have chosen to go into this playground, and he's not going to play fair with either one of you. You're going to have to stay prayed up, and you're going to have to stay committed to God, and you're going to stay together and be absolutely, absolute ferocious in your walk because they're watching you. And it's important to understand that this, the things that go on in this city, your government and your media, they've lost these cities. Do you understand that? There's only one hope from all of the big cities in the United States of America, and that is a return to Jesus Christ by its people. And we who are in charge of this need to tell you that if you die and you don't know Jesus Christ, it's not good for you. So we encourage everybody. As a, now people say, well, I don't want that pastor to come back because he doesn't agree with my blah, 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 blah. I get it. I only go where, I only go where God wants me to or where I'm walking. You'll never say that I did not tell you the truth. You may not like the truth, but I will tell you the truth for your benefit. Now, I'm already on my way to heaven. I dealt with my addiction. I was a drug addict. I was an alcoholic. And when I got saved, my life was perfect. I was making 100 grand a year. I had a, basically a beautiful model wife, two kids, great job. I had nothing to be upset about, but I knew the day the Spirit of God spoke to me that if I did not get saved, I was going to go to hell. And that was too much for me to bear. I could not live with that. I can't live with that to this day. I know what the devil does. I've seen his work. I've seen mangled bodies. I have seen people that know better. I have seen people I know are not here anymore. And it's not worth it. I'm telling you, it's not worth it. And I am personally sent by God for you to know and understand how important this is. I could sit in a church and I could preach to Anybody I want to, I choose to preach to people that need to hear it. And we need to hear it. I got one last question before sure, we close ahead. out. Um, this is kind of off topic, but it's, it's, it just, when you addressed us directly, it, it reminded me of something I've been wanting to ask. Okay, so the Catholic Church has dedicated uh, exorcist preachers. Right. I know that's part of their religious sector. Right. 
uh, and they're trained, and they have to go off, for y'all that don't know, they have to go off years of training and at, right. at the Vatican, right. and a whole long thing. Uh, Christ gave us that power. Right. Does the average Christian, if God tells them to, are they able to exercise a demon, or is that something that is reserved only for those of they the Vatican are absolute, that are chosen? Every single one that takes the name of Jesus Christ had better be prepared to do it. Yeah. Now, I realize... Uh, their pastors also forgive sins, too. Yeah. There's nowhere anywhere of that is in Scripture. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And the only time the exorcist ever happened, exorcism ever happened in the Scripture was in Acts 19. And the evil spirits overcame them and defeated them. Yeah. You, you, we went over there in the church a while back. We did a lesson called Jesus I Know and Paul I Know. Yeah. How many know the devil knows exactly who you are, too? Yeah. You can sit here. The devil knows? The devil knows exactly who you are. I thought he does. He does. He knows exactly who you are and what you're doing. How does he know that, though? Because you sin. When you sin, he becomes what? your God. I mean, Wait, like, if you, I mean, if you if sin, you he sin just became once. your God. Yeah. I so, even like if you sin just once, your name just goes down to him and he goes to you. Exactly. That's exactly Same right. Exactly. The Bible says, He that sinneth is of the devil. So, it is every minister's imperative. Now, let me offer this to you. If you are a Christian, a true Christian, a blood bought Christian, a demon cannot possess you. Question. Yes, sir. What does it mean to be a true blood Christian? That means you've been to the cross, your blood has forgiven your sins, and the Holy Ghost lives inside of you. If you have come to Jesus, and you have been come to the cross and been saved, been baptized, that means you are a child of God. It is a physical impossibility for them to come into your body and live. Which you mean you say come to the cross? The cross is where the blood was shed for your sins. Well, you make sense you get baptized. Tied, tied, okay. You, no, no, you come to the cross and then get baptized. You don't get baptized, that's it. You can't, if you come to the baptized, if you get baptized without coming to the cross, you go down to the West Center, you go down to the Dry Center, you go to the West Center. You, yes, sir. By coming to the cross, do you mean like, um, Taking God as your holy Savior, Jesus Christ, and stuff like that, right? When you come to the cross, you repent of your, you confess and repent of your sins. You confess and repent of your sins, and then you ask Jesus to be Lord of your life. Then it's okay, so you do that, say we do that, and then right. you, you slip up again, and you die. You repent it, but then you slip up, and then you die. But you have faith in Christ. You're going to have it. Jesus he just didn't ask you to be perfect. He's not, now he has not he has not granted sin. You are the Bible says let a man examine himself. You are to make a conscious effort. To be like to be Christ. Christ. Okay, so because I think a lot of people get discouraged and then I've just worked with kids right. I got for it. years. Um discouraged because I mean they look at us and they see we for the most part do right, you know. And then it's like, they're so tempted, you know, and so they'll get discouraged, or you may even have a kid that may commit suicide, or just different things, get down and depressed because they're trying to be so perfect, but their temptations are just so great and they can't. Well, it's not about that. You're, you're saved through grace, through faith, and that not yourself. Right, so that's why I want them to, to understand. I'm not saying sin. Right. It's not what I'm saying. I got a question. Yes. Go ahead. Um, what happens if, like, you went to the cross before, but you haven't got baptized? Well, I think you should get baptized. I, okay. think, I think your salvation is, is, is the, uh, the, the doctrine is called regeneration, where the sin's gone and the Holy Spirit lives that's, inside. But I do think you should be baptized in the water, yes. Because every time I try to get baptized, something's up with the pastor that tries to do it. Like, something. If you want to get baptized, you let me know. And I'll come out here, I'll personally come out here and fill that pool up and baptize any kid that wants to be baptized. Uh, we, we're baptizing all We baptize. We, we got a pool back there. Well, and, but we have to do that. I mean, that, that's something we can't neglect. Yeah. Right. And I realize we're all busy, but we got to get that done. If someone gets saved, they need to be baptized. Actually, Friday we're doing baptisms yeah, we're doing at Ken's Road. Friday. We, we got the, yeah. We'll, we'll, After we get done. We'll, can, we'll do the other Friday, too, the yeah, Friday we're afternoon. We're going to be doing them every month, folks. Okay, so for anybody listening, it is vitally important yeah. if you're going to be in ministry 
the first thing to do, there's the, this is the most important thing. The end game here is to get them saved. Yeah. The second one is to get them baptized. Yeah. And the third is to disciple. Yeah. You can't just throw them out there and say, look, we got somebody saved. It is your job as a pastor to help them find their way to yeah. the Christian faith. And I know, I know that a lot of them, that's why churches have youth pastors, that's why churches have young adult pastors, yeah. or supposed to, if they're big enough, uh, men's ministries, women's ministries, so that you can be ministered to after you get saved and not be left in the lurch. Right. You know, that's and, why we moved to Sunny Side to walk with them right. so that they would see that. Yeah. Well, it becomes relatable. Yeah, yeah. We'll give but, up our lives but, of, of what we could be doing right. to make sure that but they know Christ. If, yeah. if something happened to her, to you, and you die tonight, you've been to the cross, and you've had the blood forgive your sins. The name of Jesus is in your heart. You don't have anything to worry about. But I highly recommend that if it's possible that, you know, baptism doesn't save anybody. Salvation is on the cross of Jesus Christ. The shedding of blood for the remission of sins. And when, when this, you know why mankind didn't die in the Garden of Eden when he sinned? A sacrifice was offered. Remember when he gave him the coats of the animals? Well, he put that animal on he put, put that animal on an altar and sacrificed their sins because you cannot you cannot he, he cannot be in the presence of sin. <clears throat> and so not only when he sacrificed the animal were their sins forgiven, but the coat, the, the fur of them made a coat to keep them warm at night. That's how much God loved them. Yeah. So that is amazing. Yeah. Well, uh, for those listening that are tuned in right now, uh, Friday, 6 o'clock, Kings Row. What's the address? 4000 Barbary? Uh, 4141. 4141 Barbary, Kings Row Apartments. Uh, we will be having Hip Hop Hope 6 p.m. And we will be baptizing. Uh, for those who would like to be saved uh, and baptized, there will be an open altar call, as there always is. But there were 21 uh, children who were saved a couple weeks ago. And uh, we will now be following up and doing the uh, baptismal uh, with water uh, part. We got a uh, way to fill the tub up over there. So uh, we'll be out there. Uh, we're there, what, every first and third Friday? Second and fourth. Every second and fourth Friday. <laughs> My wife is uh, head of the Hip Hop Hope thing out here. I I'm coming next time. Drive the van and do the thing. Mm -hmm. Pastor I'll Mike will be joining us time mm -hmm. after this. If you want to. Yeah. Sure. So. Well, with that being said, um, I'd like to go ahead and close out. Uh, does anybody want to lead us in a prayer before we leave? Any of the youth? Joe. Oh, Sean Boy. There we go, Sean Boy. Sean was about to step it up. Go ahead and pray us out, Sean Boy. Get your microphone. Wrap it. Um, this is breaking okay um i'll buy you uh, guys by you here all right come here come to you today i want to thank you for all that you've done for us all that you got planned for us i want you to uh, bless uh over everyone in this room all my family and friends everyone family and friends that's also in here Keep sending out the blessings to Sunnyside Dreams and uh, any and to the families um, for the people who's lost. Uh, send blessings out to their family in Jesus' name. We pray, Amen. 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 Thank you all for tuning God in. Bless you guys. Hey, I appreciate the input. Thank man. you. We will be live again tomorrow at <laughs> 6 p.m. Uh, right now we're going to get into a little bit of a. Uh, a mix. Uh, we got 80 to problem solve or walk by faith. Thank you guys for tuning in tonight. Nice, buddy. Uh,